It's no secret that things get weird when talking about space travel, but did you know that underneath one of the primary American rocket launch facilities is an entire rubber bunker accessible by a 200-foot-long slide designed for astronauts to escape a catastrophic event? Or that these days, it's basically abandoned? This is the story of NASA's secret rubber room. Most of us know the basics of the space race's beginnings, but for reference, let's do a quick recap. On October the 4th, 1957, the USSR launched the small satellite Sputnik into orbit using a modified intercontinental ballistic missile. They kept their lead in space technology when they proceeded to launch a cosmonaut into low orbit in April of 1961. Though each of these accomplishments was followed quickly by an American equivalent, the context of all this is really important. When a young, charismatic president John F. Kennedy addressed a joint session of Congress in May of 1961. He highlighted the urgent need for rapid improvements in America's rocketry program, publicly tasking the almost equally young National Aeronautics and Space Administration with practically no forewarning and no infrastructure in place to accomplish this consequential mission. The chosen launch site had always been in Florida, since it's easier to launch aircraft nearer to the equator. NASA, however, had no permanent facilities there. In fact, until this address, they had been sharing joint facilities for testing military rocketry, which was problematic as Kennedy's open insistence that this be a civil endeavor meant that this state of affairs could not continue. On top of that, they needed a much larger rocket than anything anyone had ever built. The Cape Canaveral Air Force Station pads couldn't handle the size or weight. NASA duly moved rocket experts such as Warner Von Buren from their previous base in Alabama and acquired a large plot of land on Merritt Island, just north of Cape Canaveral. Beginning construction of the Space Center and Launch Complex 39 in 1962. Launch Complex 39 was originally intended to have five launch pads. However, due to budgeting, only two pads were ever built, as building all five would have been considered redundant. This challenged NASA's original method for constructing and launching vehicles. So they would build them initially in a semi-permanent but mobile structure on the launch pad, stacking the rocket and capsule components vertically. This meant previous launches were plagued with weather delays and technical faults. Not to mention this was all slower than the Soviet system of assembling the rockets horizontally and then delivering them to the launch point by specialized rail carriages that would stand them up to the launch pad. The first launch from Complex 39 was Apollo 8, which was fired off Pad 39A on the 21st of December 1968. 39A was already being prepared for Flight 11, so the pad could finally successfully see through its role as a backup. All of these facilities were built for the same ship, the Saturn V rocket. At their largest point, these rockets were 111 meters tall and 10 meters wide, making them the core of the Apollo program. The Saturn VS contained a potential 42 terajoules of explosive force. When the launches were adequately controlled, there was no issue, and this force was more than sufficient to launch to the moon for the landing mission. Still, if there was even a gradual fuel leak from the liquid hydrogen tanks, the entire structure of the launch pad would be destroyed instantly. So to avoid this type of disaster, NASA had to prepare proper emergency facilities for the astronauts and tower crew. In other words, they needed an underground water bunker accessible by a massive slide. You can still travel to Cape Canaveral and see the pads during launches or tours. You can even see them on televised launches for SpaceX. The astronauts and ground crews had to be trained in safety and countermeasures for failure, which NASA learned all too late after numerous failed launches. The protocol was simple, leave the capsule, descend under the launch pad via elevator, exit the elevator at the mobile launcher vehicle's A-dock, and make a break for the emergency exit leading to a bunker buried under 12 feet of concrete. This exit was a 60-meter rubber slide connecting the primary vehicle to the bunker. 
Astronauts and ground crew would use an emergency sprinkler at the top of the slide to gain momentum so that they could enter the emergency bunker in a final chamber much faster. This was the rubber room. It earned that name for the thick rubber walls on each side to cushion the crew on the slide and absorb the shocks of the explosion. To ease and accommodate the crew's escape, the bottom of the slide in the room was flat and offered a few meters of material meant to slow the escapees down before they would hit a wall. On the left side, coming down from the slide was a six inch thick steel door surrounded by rubber walls and thicker steel reinforced concrete. This was attached to a round room with seating for 20 workers or astronauts under a domed ceiling. Under the floor were 20 massive springs to absorb the shock of any explosion, and the crew was strapped into further shock-absorbing chairs. If these weren't enough, fire blankets and other emergency items were in the bunker to keep the 20 men alive for up to 24 hours until help could arrive from the surface. This amazing structure would also protect the astronauts from any fire above it, up to an estimated 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. However, if the damage was more substantial than the initial estimates, the bunker was prepared for that too. If necessary, a carbon dioxide scrubber would keep the air fresh for longer. Still, if that wasn't enough or if it had somehow been damaged, the bunker included specially designed candles that could extend the oxygen supply by burning a mixture of iron powder and sodium chloride. The rubber room was publicized during NASA's preparations and press briefings before and during Apollo launches. But fortunately, despite this publicity, it never had to be used for a catastrophe. The Apollo missions accomplished Kennedy's goal of getting America to the moon. Still, eventually, the public became bored with the launches, only regaining interest when it was obvious something had gone wrong. Six successful landings were accomplished from 1969 to 1972. Most passed into obscurity as public interest dried up along with congressional funding. When the Apollo program ended, so did any use for the rubber rooms and emergency bunkers, and they faded fast. Without regular maintenance, they were consumed by natural flooding and left unseen by human eyes until they were revitalized during the space shuttle program. NASA and the Park Service officially designated them as historical sites. Still, they are incredibly difficult to see, especially since flooding in 39B damaged the bunker's lead paint which had begun to peel off and contaminate the air of the main chamber. 39A didn't use lead paint, so it's still accessible, but only under heavy restriction. So, although they were brilliantly designed and are some of the most technically impressive bunkers on the Lower East Coast, their time as valuable instruments for space travel is over. Improved rockets and safety techniques have moved beyond them, as things in life eventually always do. Fortunately, these days, space flight accidents are now rarer than ever. Nonetheless, it's a shame that these aren't better documented or easier to see today. So we're going to leave it there. But I thank you all for watching. I really hope you'll hit subscribe. And until next time, I'm Ryan Sokash, signing off.